been looking forward to this opportunity to be and to play a small role in uh, this gospel meeting. Appreciate, as it was prayed for just a moment ago, the, uh, the preparations that have been made for an occasion like this. And, of course, in light of the last calendar year and local churches once again returning to uh, opportunities such as this this week to uh, be able to have the gospel proclaimed and worship God in spirit and in truth. I've known Daniel for uh, a long while now. We're good friends and uh, Daniel's held meetings in, in most of the places that I have preached. And so when I was at Norton in the early 2000s, Daniel was there. I've been at Barberton now 12 years this summer. Uh, Daniel's been there here a number of years ago with me at Barberton. So I know Daniel and his family real well. Appreciate that. Uh, he mentioned camp, and my wife and I, uh, being the new directors, we were the directors last year, but of course the decision was made for us last year. Uh, this year, uh, he, he acknowledged my wife and I, but it's become my wife's full-time job. <laughs> she works full-time at the local schools in Barberton, uh, but she comes home in the evening, and so I, I kind of chuckle that Camp Appalachia has become her full-time job now. It's a lot of work, but uh, one that we think is good and good for our, our youth. I'd like to spend a few moments this morning talking about why I must. This lesson this morning is actually a single lesson uh, from a series of lessons that I have developed and preached uh, in Barberton. And uh, parents typically really appreciate the introductions uh, to these lessons. And so if you are children here and, and, and you're listening, I call you to be very attentive. I use some illustrations, the parent-child relationship to jumpstart this lesson, and I do this with every lesson in this series, but I'm just going to preach one of the lessons uh, this week, and it's this particular uh, lesson about why I must. And so a father uh, tells his son to clean up his room, right? So mom or dad says, you know, go clean up your room. And sure enough, that child asks why, right? kind of like stomping their feet a little bit. The child doesn't really want to do it. You can tell by the way that he or she asked the question. And so the father says, what does every parent say? I've said it. You've said it, right? Because I said so. And so in this case, the son proceeds to go and clean his room as the father had instructed. But if you actually think about this situation logically... There are actually a lot of reasons as to why that son or child should go and clean his or her room. And so consider for a moment in this illustration, how about because he needs to be responsible for his space. And so I've got some teenagers, my children are old enough uh, that they can be responsible for their space. And so they can learn and they can go and do and they can be responsible for those things that are theirs. How about taking care of his belongings? How about simply just taking care of those things uh, that belong to him? How about cleanliness, right? You get out of bed at night and your floor is so messy and you're stepping on Legos and which, by the way, is probably the best home self-defense weapon there is. <laughs> Right? You step on a Lego, you're going to know it. Right, You're going to trip over things. Mom and dad can hear you clanging and banging as you're trying to get up from bed and go use the restroom in the middle of the night. How about to make sure his dirty clothes make it to the wash? There are occasions my children have clothes that are sprung all over their floor. They're not clean. They're dirty. They haven't even made it to the hamper in their room, let alone to the laundry room. So to make sure that his dirty clothes get to the wash, right? He wakes up for school Monday morning. Dad, where's my white Nike shirt at? I don't know, son. Your mom and I have been doing the laundry. If it has found its way to the laundry room, it's probably clean in your clean basket. If it's, if, if it's still on your floor, then it's still dirty. How about and on we could go? I use a lot of other illustrations like dad says, take the trash out. And the child says, why? Every parent has said it. It's quick and it's easy, and it's on the basis that I said so. <clears throat> Take the trash out. Why, Dad? Because I said so. I told you to do it, and therefore I want you to do it. Think about the trash for a moment, right? The trash can's full. Most people, right, you're stuffing it down in there. How much more can I get in there? If you got a dog, now he's coming over there eating out of the trash. 
Or how about if you just emptied out the refrigerator? Maybe, you know, mom just cleaned out the fridge and so there's just food that was left over that's no good. And if it's left in the house in the trash can, it's going to start smelling. In most communities today, we have curbside trash pickup. In many communities, we have those plastic bins now. And so in order for the trash to get picked up by the local trash company, the trash actually has to, yes, children, the trash actually has to find its way from inside the house to the trash bin outside. And the trash bin then, therefore, to the curb. The point is this, that you give instruction to your child and they ask why, and every parent has said, quickly, because I said so. But whether it's cleaning the room or whether it's uh, taking the laundry out, whether it's go brush your teeth, if you actually sit back and look at those scenarios logically, there are lots of reasons for my child to clean his or her room, or my child to take the trash out, or my child to empty the dishwasher, or my child to brush his or her teeth. We could give some real plausible reasons as to why they should do those things. Again, what parent has not urged his or her child to do a thing on the basis that God said so? And that brings us to our lesson this morning. It's a very basic lesson, but perhaps I can help to bring this into focus for us. Why I must hear the gospel. Why is it so necessary that I hear the gospel? Well, how about because God said so? The fact of the matter is that God has said to hear the gospel. Every parent ought to be able to appreciate this on the basis regarding instruction that we've given to our children, and they ask why, and we respond, because I said so. And God our Father, God our Creator, has said, in Matthew 17 and verse 5, God said, right? While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. God said, hear him why should i listen to jesus well because god said so but just like that parent child relationship if we actually observe the new testament scripture there are a number of reasons now if there were no other reason than that of because god said so that alone should be sufficient for me to comply with god's instruction or command to hear his son but if you open up the Bible and you study and you read, you'll come to learn that there are a number of plausible reasons as to why I should hear the gospel. And so notice, first of all, because faith comes by hearing. And so God's word, this good book, is capable of producing faith in the hearts of men. But the word first must be heard. You know well what Paul said. In Romans 10, 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Again, why should I listen to Jesus? Why should I hear him? And by the way, this is how Jesus talks to us today. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, Paul said, And the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And so here's God talking to us today, specifically in the gospel dispensation, through or via the New Testament. I want you to think about the book of Acts for a moment. Every single case of conversion, when someone become a Christian or obeyed the gospel, the very first thing that took place was the hearing of the gospel. You can start in Acts 2 with the Jews on the day of Pentecost. You can go to Acts chapter 8 and you can read about the Samaritan, Simon, and the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus. Acts 10 and 11, the conversion of the Gentiles. In Acts 16, uh, Lydia and the Philippian jailer. Acts 18, the Corinthians. Acts 19, right? The Ephesians. All of those chapters, Acts 2, 8, 9, 10, 11, 16, 18, and 19, record for us the various cases of conversion when folks became Christians. And the very first thing that took place was that they heard the gospel. Now, why must I hear the gospel? Why must I listen to Jesus and his authoritative voice? Well, ultimately, because God said so. Those of you that were in our Bible class, right? God said to Moses in Numbers 20, strike the rock. Why? The ultimate answer is because God said so. Now, there are other reasons, right? 
we could give some other plausible and reasonable answers to that question. But ultimately, God said to Moses in Numbers 20, speak to the rock. And God has commanded us to hear, to listen to the authoritative voice of his son. It's no wonder why then that Paul said, so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. This good book provides evidence, right? There's internal evidence. We're going to talk a little bit about evidences later on in this week, but evidence is internal. This book provides evidence that God is, that Jesus is real. There's external evidence, uh, God's creation. And so God said, listen, and you and I can weigh out the evidence. In the book of Ephesians chapter 13, uh, Paul actually talks about their conversion. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, Paul said in him, that's Jesus, you also trusted. When did the Ephesians trust in Jesus? Watch this. Paul said, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When did the Ephesians trust in Jesus? They trusted in Jesus after they heard, after they listened to the gospel message, the good news of Jesus the Christ. And so you see, why must I hear the gospel? Well, yeah, because God said so. But also that faith comes by hearing God's word. Notice number two. How about there's a message to be heard? Have you ever sat back for a moment and just thought about when God says to hear his word? When God says to hear or to listen to him, the command itself actually necessarily infers that there's a message to be heard. Think about a parent-child relationship. A parent says to his or her child, listen, are you listening to me, right? And what you're conveying is, before you've even delivered the message, is that there's something that you want them to pay attention to. And so when God says to hear him in Matthew 17 and 5, it necessarily infers that there's a message to be heard. And so when God says, hear him, listen to him, give attention to him, there's a message to be heard. There's something that God wants us to hear and learn about. The Apostle Paul was in the city of Corinth somewhere around 52 AD. He's actually physically there preaching the gospel. Now about three, two to three years later, he's going to write 1 Corinthians. And then 2 Corinthians. But Paul was physically in Corinth somewhere around 52 AD. And here's what Paul said about that occasion. He actually wrote about it in 1 Corinthians 15. You can read the first four verses. I'll start in verse 3. It says that Paul preached. So Paul says, when I was there with you a couple years ago, he says that I preached, and I quote, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. What's the message that God wants us to hear? My friends, this is the gospel in a nutshell. If you want to try to give somebody a brief explanation, the gospel in a nutshell. It's like, you know, today it's amazing. It's actually astonishing that in a 30 second commercial, how much information can be conveyed by advertisers. You ever think about that? A 30-second commercial, a 60-second commercial, they can convey a lot of information. Here's the gospel in like a 30-second commercial, if you will, in a nutshell. Paul says that Christ died for our sins, so the death of Jesus. In verse number 4, it says that he was buried. So we got the death, and now we have the burial of Jesus. And then it says he rose again. That's the message that God wants man to hear. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. That is the divine message that God wants us to hear. Brother Daniel just read from 2 Timothy chapter 3. He read the entirety of that chapter. That would be a good chapter to study in light of our current climate. As Paul talks about the perilous times, he talks about how evil men promote those times. He talks about his personal conduct in that time. And then he talks about the answer. You know, as preachers, we often cite 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 as proof of the Bible being divinely inspired, and that's what it says. It says that Scripture is of divine origin. It is God-breathed. But in context, that's the answer to perilous times. That's, 
Paul's talking about perilous times. What's the answer to it? The word of God is the answer. In light of man's need for salvation, that's the message to be heard. God's word, the gospel. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 21, Peter said, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Think about it for a moment. When God said, Hear my son, it necessarily infers that there was a message to be heard. Now, God said, Hear him. How many men have said why? And God's reply could be, and rightly so, on the basis that he said so. But as we've already discovered, there are some reasonable and plausible explanations that further help us to appreciate why God would want us to hear or listen to his son. How about number three? How about the gospel is God's power unto salvation? In the book of Romans chapter 1, now, I don't know. Uh, I'd like to think that perhaps when Paul was writing this, um, that the pen was pressed against the paper very firmly. Because if he was to orate it, that he would be with great conviction. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul, why are you not ashamed of it? Why wasn't Paul ashamed of the gospel? What did he know about the gospel? What he knew about it was, and he says, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. The gospel is God's power unto salvation. The good news of Jesus the Christ. I want you to listen attentively to the following statements. Romans 5 and in verse 6, Paul says that Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5 and in verse 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, that Christ died for our sins. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. Do you want to talk about a message to be heard? That Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, Jesus, the Christ, the one who was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem, who lived and died on this earth, of whom death could not contain, and he arose from the dead. He died so that we could live. The story of Jesus does not end at the cross. It may have provided the illusion that the opponents of Jesus had won. There may be the appearance that Satan had gained the victory, except that death could not contain our Lord, and he arose. I always appreciate when the narrative talks about those women who had come to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus, and the angels were there, and they said to those women, and it makes the hair of my arm stand up, why do you seek the living among the dead? He died and arose again the third day. Why hear the gospel? Well, because the gospel is God's power unto salvation. Uh, there's a lady back home. Uh, every Sunday, uh, she brings me the Canton Repository. Um, not many newspapers has a, have a very large religious section anymore. And so one day she brought, this is like 10, 12 years ago now, back when I first started preaching at Barberton, she brought me a newspaper. There was an article and it caught her attention. And she asked me what I thought about it and so on. And, and so I said to us, you know, I'm, where'd you get that at? And so hey, she has it delivered, but there's a gas station down where she lives, 15 minutes away. And I'm like, you know what? I might have to drive down there and get one and, or subscribe to it. And she said, don't worry about it. I'll bring it to you every Sunday. And so she has faithfully brought me the religious section out of that newspaper every Sunday. I've actually developed sermons out of it. In that, in the religious section, you will find churches doing, and I mean the only limitation to what you find them doing is your own imagination. A, a place in Cleveland had a WWE wrestling tournament. Uh, I mean, from athletics to you name it. Fashion shows are popular in the Canton area. I mean, you name it, and there's a church somewhere in the world that is probably doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, the gospel is God's power unto salvation. You don't need fun and frolic, right? The gospel is what's going to save. That fashion show is not going to save anybody. Putting money under church pews <laughs> or in songbooks <laughs> that somebody one day will find accidentally 
Those kinds of gimmicks don't save. It's not what God intended. The gospel is God's power unto salvation. How about number four? Why I must hear the gospel? How about Jesus has words of eternal life? And the book of John chapter 6 and 68. But, but Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? And he says, you have the words of eternal life. In 2, Tim, or 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10, Paul said that salvation is in Christ. To be in Christ is to be in the church. How does one get into Christ? Well, Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you're outside the body of Christ this morning, you are in an unsaved condition. Not because I said so, but because the Lord himself has declared as much through his authoritative voice revealed on the pages of the New Testament. Paul clearly said that salvation is in Christ. How do I get into Christ? Galatians 3.27 says that one is baptized into Christ. We must be doers of the word. Matthew 7.21 in our Bible class we noted how Jesus said, Not everyone who saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus himself actually said that not everyone's going to heaven. I do this frequently with the, the members back home. Uh, I tell them, you go home this afternoon and read the obituary section and come back tonight and tell me how many people are going to hell. Do it. Go, most, most of those now you can find online. You find your local newspaper, go online and click on the obituary section and you read those. And by the way, you'll find people of all ages, right? Men, women, no matter one's nationality, no matter the color of skin, death is no respecter of persons. You come back and tell me how many of those people are going to hell. Now, I don't say that to slight a person and or family in the time of the loss of their dear loved one. But I just observe from the Bible that Jesus said that not everyone who says to him, Lord, Lord, calling Jesus Lord, Lord is not sufficient to save a person. But Jesus said rather that he that does, he that doeth the will of my Father in heaven. And so, in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 9, Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know why Jesus said that in the way that he did? Well, of course the people he's talking to have ears, right? They can hear him. They're listening to him. But the one who hears, as Jesus would have us to hear, is one who seeks the truth, understands, and obeys. I want you to think with me for just a moment. Now, you could do this with every, so why I must hear the gospel, why I must believe, why I must repent, why I must confess my faith in Jesus as Son of God, why I must be baptized, why I must live faithful. And you could talk about any, why I must worship in spirit and truth, right? And, well, we could ultimately conclude that I must do all of those things if there was no other point or observation to make, we could just simply conclude on the basis that God said so, right? Because God said to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Because God said to live faithful. And here's the thing about this. The Bible is not just for the other fella. And sometimes that's how we treat it. Now, the heart of this lesson certainly would speak to somebody who's never obeyed the gospel. And if you're here this morning and not a Christian, then hopefully we've covered some points that will help you appreciate why it's necessary, why you should, why it's a must. Right? Hebrews 11 and verse 6, For without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But guess what as Christians? We don't, we don't, we're not baptized and then arise and stop listening to God. Here, consider this. There's 27 books in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John narrate for us the life of Jesus. The book of Acts covers the history of the early church. Primarily the work of Peter in the first half and Paul the second half. So simple arithmetic leaves 22 books. From Romans to Revelation, there are 22 books in the New Testament. Those books were written to Christians. Think about that. 22 of the 27 New Testament books were specifically addressed to Christians or local churches, local churches being comprised of 
those who have been obedient Christians. What's that tell us? That even as a Christian, it's necessary that I listen to God. What do we learn from Romans and Revelation? We learn about Christian behavior. We learn about Christian conduct. We learn about the new man, how we're to live. We learn about what pleases God, what glorifies God. There's a number of things that help us to consider about living in the world, but not of the world. And on we could go. And so the Bible is not just for the other fellow. Sometimes we might treat it that way. We know somebody who's in need of the gospel, and that scenario could be true, but the Bible's not just for him. It's for me, the preacher. It's for elders, deacons, and members of the church. Whether you've been a Christian for just a few months or the majority of your lifetime, you need to hear the gospel. It's a must. You need to be given heed to the authoritative voice of Jesus the Christ. We're going to sing the song this morning that's been chosen as a song of encouragement. Maybe there is one here who's never obeyed the gospel. You've heard a little bit about the good news of Jesus the Christ. How Jesus, the Son of God, left heaven, came to this earth. He experienced life as we do, or we as he did. But Jesus felt the experience of life from a wedding feast to a death of a friend. Uh, Jesus felt pain and suffering. Matter of fact, he prayed in the garden. He said, let this cup pass from me. That would be the cup of suffering. I'm convinced that Jesus didn't want to suffer. But ultimately, as he said, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And so Jesus uh, experienced uh, Roman custom and was beaten. Uh, one of the most cruelest things, it's, it's a universal sign of hate. You could go anywhere, anywhere in the world and spit on somebody and they would know that it's a sure sign of hate or a lack of respect. They spit on Jesus, ridiculed him, mocked him. He experienced all those things in life. And ultimately, he dies on the cross. He sheds his blood and his death. But here's the thing, not for his sins, but for my sins, for your sins, for the sins of the ungodly. Jesus was without sin. He bore no sin. But he bore the penalty of our sins in his death on the cross. He was taken down, laid in the tomb. Again, perhaps the appearance is that those who stood in opposition to Jesus have won. But it was not to be so. Even Jesus prophesied and foretold that he would arise in three days. He spake about how Jonah would serve as a sign to that generation. And so death could not contain our Lord and he arose from the dead. Later, he ascended to the right hand of his Father in heaven, where he now sits and from which point he reigns. And so that Jesus died so that you could have your sins forgiven. You believe in God? Are you willing to make changes in your life, conform your life to God's will? The Bible calls it repentance. It involves two things, a change of mind and a change of action. In other words, let's say, for example, I'm a thief. If I'm going to repent of stealing, then I've got to stop stealing and get a, a godly means of income to provide for myself and or my family. The Bible says to confess our faith in Jesus as the Son of God. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? If you do, confess it and then be baptized. You might say, why? And I could say, because God said so. But, of course, we know that baptism is for the remission of sins. And baptism itself enacts the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so we take the old man, we, we crucify those sins of the old man, we do away with those things, we are buried in the death of Jesus, at which time we figuratively contact his blood, which is said to wash away our sins. And just as Jesus arose to walk, we arise from the waters of baptism to walk in newness of life as a child of God. And we present ourselves unto God as living sacrifices maybe you've done those things and as a christian you haven't been faithful to god listen the gospel is not just for the other fella god's got a plan for the erring christian and it involves he or she repenting of their sin and con and confessing their faults one unto another and praying to god for forgiveness if there might be one in this good assembly this morning that needs to make his or her life right with god the good church here would be just thrilled excited to help you and once you come all together we stand in